was your initial reaction, Rob, when you heard this, this story of this uh, very strange sounding disease? Well, I couldn't believe it at first, um, but I couldn't believe more the fact that it had kind of fallen into my lap. I was a third year um, media studies student, mm. you know, and thinking... Overloaded about, with cash. No and then thinking, <laughs> what am I going to do? And I thought, oh, I've got the biggest story here, mm. you know, it, it's fantastic. And, um, Mad Cow has, has had subsided, but um, knowing that I had access to the story through Michael, um, who I'd, I'd known had this history of work in Papua New Guinea, but I had no idea that he'd had this connection to Kuru. Um, and it was only when Ben gave me a book um, called Deadly Feasts, which was a story which goes into more detail, but is along the same lines as, as, as the film we see there. And it doesn't follow Michael as a character, but it introduces you to um, Kuru as the, as the first point, and then to CJD and into mad cow disease. And I thought, this is just stranger than fiction, you mm. know, and it's, it, it's just amazing. And, and then I guess we just started having a few sessions, sitting down with Michael and probing and asking questions and getting more t details and just thinking, this is just absolutely fantastic. Mm. And so we, um, well, the first thing that we did was have to go to Papua New Guinea to see if the foray would be happy for us to do a story about about Kuru because it was it was integral that this wasn't going to be a story just about Kuru from a scientist perspective. What was interesting was their whole belief system and Michael's connection to the foray. And mm. it was only when we sort of got there that we discovered they were our eyewitness to Michael. Mm. You know, and we got a much deeper level to the story. So what was the reception you received then? I mean, you, you didn't obviously have the same standing as Michael. You're an outsider now coming in. Yeah, well, it was interesting. Um, we, were, we were very fortunate that we sort of could come in through the back door with, with our connection to Michael and the, the PNG Institute for Medi of Medical Research. Um, but one of the main reasons why we had to go in that early stage to find out if they'd be happy to do a story as well was because previously, I think, the BBC had been up there um, to do a story on cannibalism. And I don't think that the, the foray were very comfortable about the way they were treated in the telling of the story, a fly in, fly out, not participate in with them so much. So, so we went there and really just spent two weeks um, starting to record stories and tell them what we wanted them to do and that this was a story as much about Michael as it was about them. And as soon as they started or learned that we were telling stories about Michael, they jumped <laughs> up. And we would have people coming from villages hearing that we were doing these stories and people were bringing people to us to record their stories. Um, it was really quite amazing. So that was uh, before you actually the, you started the documentary Yeah, properly. that was all part of just, just the recce. Yeah, we went in 2001 to come back to, to Perth to, um, to put together a treatment and to show the broadcasters that we had access to the story, access to characters, and access to archival material to, to then go and do the main shoot. Because I think one of the things that was quite remarkable about the, the documentary was just how openly those elders spoke about those practices of, uh, you know, not just uh, the, the consumption of human flesh, but also this, this whole thing about sorcery. It must, have been, it must have taken quite a bit of effort to gain that kind of confidence. Uh, yeah, it did. And we were very fortunate as well that... Um, Again, because of Michael's ties, we had access to the right sort of people in the village, and in particular, um, one young man, Wandagi Parko, um, who had a really good understanding of English language and, and was a 4A person himself. So we would have discussions at night talking about the story and things that we wanted to explore, and he could then put into a language that was common to the 4A what we were after. And, and as people started cottoning on to the depth that, that we wanted to go to and not just giving us superficial answers, 
um, we sort of discovered that the foray, which Michael would have already known, are amazing storytellers. And we had, like I said before, people would sit outside and hear our, our one person tell the story and the next person would have a bigger story to tell. <laughs> you know, oh, they didn't tell you about this. <laughs> you know, and then we'd talk quietly. <laughs> so, so we really did get an amazing um, insight into, into parts of their culture. 